And behind in dock there, we can see HMS Warrior, one of the original ironclads, permanently docked in Portsmouth now. So they will make their way out through that gap in the foreground, out into the Solent. Wonderful natural harbour. The Patricia actually looks after boys from the Farne Islands right round to Portsmouth, a tremendous beach she has, the Farne Islands up in Northumberland, and her sister ship looks after the other side of the country, the western side. Seems to be a particularly inappropriate moment for a, uh, a ferry to be coming in at the same time. Yeah, they invent purple airways for royal movements when no other aircraft are allowed within normally five miles of. But uh, that doesn't seem to apply to shipping quite so much. And on South Sea Common with the Naval Memorial in the background, they wait for the Royal Yacht to come out and also for the first part of the fly past, the historic fly past led by two fairy swordfish torpedo bombers. part of the Royal Yacht Squadron which will provide the escort for the Royal Yacht is HMS Active which will move in behind the Royal Yacht for the review now we get an early sight of the first part of the historic fly past the fairy swordfish the fleet air arm or representing the fleet air arm be coming in at about 200 feet 90 knots operated by the Royal Naval Historical Flight at Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton still some way out from Portsmouth maneuvering getting ready to run in over the dock and over the top of the memorial as the Royal Yacht passes Now the Royal Yacht gathering ahead of steam as she comes out of the harbour. All the heads of state on board, including King Harold of Norway. Luxembourg, Prince John and the Grand Duchess, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, President Lech Wałęsa from Poland, Right Honourable Jim Bolger and his wife, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Right Honourable Paul Keating, the Prime Minister of Australia. Be interesting to be a fly on the wall hearing him talking to Her Majesty the Queen. the Premier of Canada, the Right Honourable Jean Chrétien, and his wife. The seafront at Southie has been blocked off to traffic for the last 24 hours or so. Music for the Royal Party, provided by the Royal Marines.
the very famous naval base, the former naval dockyard where HMS Victory is permanently in dry dock, the famous flagship of Admiral Lord Nelson. Still officially the flagship of the Commander-in-Chief fleet. Commissioned just over 40 years ago and still going strong. leaves the narrow neck of the natural harbour, led by Patricia out into the Solent. And looking from on board at the massive crowds on the shore. The water's really quite still now, just a little bit of chop. 24 hours or so ago, we had uh, tremendous storms blowing through. As has already been said, very reminiscent of what it must have been like 50 years ago. Conditions now actually just about ideal, I think. Maybe it could be a little bit less wind, ideally. Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs in the background looking over the side. First Lady just going out of picture and President Clinton. And many distinguished guests on board, including one or two distinguished soldiers. Field Marshal the Lord Carver and Field Marshal Sir Peter Inge and Field Marshal Bramall. all on board as guests of Her Majesty the Queen. The old string bag. Just two left flying. Fifty-one and fifty-two years old, respectively, the two that are up. Not actually a D-Day veteran, they flew in the Battle of the Atlantic. swordfish were actually delivered to the Fleet Air Arm in 1936. They were outdated by 1939, but they did remain operational to the end of the war. Probably the last British biplane to see active service. Here she comes, powered by a 750 horsepower Pegasus radial engine, capable of 120 knots in level flight. And these aircraft sank over 300,000 tons of enemy shipping in World War II, directly involved in sinking over 20 U-boats. that must have been 
very familiar 50 years ago. Crew of three, pilot up front, the bomb aimer in the middle and tail gunner behind. Now the next formation. An old Dakota in the background. Firefly, Hurricane and the Bristol Blenheim in Vic formation, followed by the Lancaster. sound, the old Merlin engines. The Lancaster from the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. 40 squadrons of them operating with Bomber Command at D-Day. chatting with Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. Next, the Spitfires. Two of them in low-level battle formation. A third, there she is. There should be a Vic. They're in loose formation. Mark 9, flown by OC-11 Group, Air Commodore Cliff Spink. One of them flown by Colonel Berry Mako from the Dutch Air Force, an F-16 pilot. <laughs> Meanwhile, Britannia makes her stately way out into the Solent, followed by the pleasure craft. Her Majesty last reviewed the fleet at Spithead back in 1978, the Silver Jubilee. Phil Marshall, the Lord Carver, himself a veteran of D-Day. And now a formation of 20 Hawk T1 and T1A trainers from RAF Chivna. And of course, it's 50 years since D-Day, the modern day RAF's tribute to the men of the Royal Air Force and many other Air Forces whose skill and courage in the days and weeks leading up to D-Day helped ensure the success of the invading ground forces. The big week. Now formations representing all the various different air forces. This is the Royal Air Force and the Fleet Air Arm. Four tornadoes in a box with two on either wing of Harrier FRS-1s from 899 Squadron at Yeovilton. The tornadoes, GR-1As from 13 Squadron at RAF Mara. Led by their Squadron Commander, Wing Commander Steve Jordan. Royal Australian Air Force, coming from one squadron at Amberley.
roaring of fast jets. And now F-18s, eight of them from the Canadian Air Force. Well, in fact, that's uh, from the US Air Force. F-14s from the US Navy and F-15 Eagles from the US Air Force. line abreast F-15 Eagles bringing up the rear of the fly past from a highly significantly of course the US Air Force who played a tremendous role in the bombing that went up that led up to D-Day that helped to virtually nullify the Luftwaffe Tremendous excitement for everyone along the foreshore. And uh, they can now see, you can see those four black objects just turning to starboard. And those are the landing craft from HMS Fearless, which are going into the Naval Memorial, where they'll pick up the national flags that were used during the drumhead ceremony and take them back to Fearless. This on board the landing craft. Once on board, Phyllis, she will sail across the channel to France, where the national flags will again be taken ashore. Led by their escorts, of 50 Royal Marines, 50 US Marines. In the background, we can hear a crash and thump now of the 42 gun salute being fired by HMS Illustrious, the flagship of CNC Fleet, being fired from their traditional Navy three pounder saluting guns. Very different to the massive naval bombardments from the 15-inch guns of battleships like Ramillies and Warspite, but nonetheless, the sound must be reminiscent for those that were there landing on the beaches on D-Day. This, of course, all done with great ceremony now. Imagine what it must have been like when you were in one of those things, landing on the beaches in Normandy under intense, hostile enemy fire. The men, perhaps, who are sometimes forgotten are those that crew the landing craft, who were shuttling back and forth from their mother ships under heavy fire. preparing to review the international flotilla. The view from Trinity House vessel Patricia as she leads the Royal Yacht along the review line. The Royal Yacht still making her way out to the center of the channel. In fact, just checking the chart to make sure that uh, the captain knows he's in the right place.
yacht with her pleasure craft escort. There's a good breeze now tugging the, the uh, standards and flags out stiffly. I think it's probably about a, a force five up there now. Good sailing weather. And she's approaching the illustrious, the first ship in the review. President Clinton, who is on board for this phase only. After the review, he will move to his own ship, massive aircraft carrier, George Washington. Meanwhile, on shore. National flags march on board the landing craft. particularly good sailors they've not got far to go but imagine traveling a, a few miles in really rough seas in one of those not much fun you can understand why a lot of the troops were very keen indeed to get off their landing craft and onto the beaches the 42 gun salute complete Royal Yacht approaches illustrious. One of three light aircraft carriers, HMS Illustrious, of course, Invincible and Art Royal, the other two. She was uh, heavily modernized a couple of years ago. The flagship of CNC Fleet Admiral Sir Hugo White would normally have a carrier air group on board with up to nine Harriers and nine Sea Kings and also three air electronic warfare Sea Kings. But just the FRS-2 Harrier, which we saw landing earlier, and also the Merlin, the naval version of the Westland EH-101 helicopter. Well, she represents here, I think, three separate things. First of all, she's one of the Navy's capital ships, although we now call that principal platforms. And in that sense, she represents the British battleships, which played a very important role in the, in the bombardment force, War Spite, Ramillies, Nelson and Rodney, the latter two coming a, a, a little bit after D-Day. Secondly, she was laid down as a through-deck cruiser. And as a cruiser, she represents the 17 Royal Navy cruisers, which were really key assets in the bombardment phase. They have the right size of gun and the right rapidity of fire to inflict just the right amount of damage on the enemy batteries ashore. And thirdly, as a carrier, particularly an anti-submarine carrier, she represents the three escort carriers, which played an absolutely key role further down the channel, keeping the U-boats at bay. And at the bows of the ship, just where the Merlin was, of course, the ski ramp as well, the very clever design. That's now been modernized to a 13 degree ski ramp for launching the Harriers. Next in the line, one of two amphibious assault ships, HMS Fearless. The other one, Intrepid, is currently under refit in Portsmouth and has been kept in reserve. The mother ship of the landing craft, which are making their way off the beach. They'll be heading out into the main choppy waters of the Solent, back to the mothership. Fearless built by Harland Wolf 
in Belfast, commissioned in 1965, so she's another old lady. Was actually due for scrapping in 1984, but various circumstances, not least of which the Falklands, or that, that wasn't the main cause, but her uh, rescue was vindicated, or her reprieve was vindicated by the Falklands War. There were, there were two ships rather like Fearless in the Normandy landings. They were called Northway and Oceanway. They were landing ships dock, and although they were used mainly as repair ships for the smaller landing craft who could move in and out of the docks, one of them took over no less than 46 loaded ducks, amphibious, um, uh, amphibious uh, vehicles, which they landed on, uh, 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 um, on one of the beaches, and the other one uh, took over 20 landing craft uh, of the small size that, that you've just seen, uh, which, again, were used to land vehicles, and then the two ships played very important roles in keeping all the landing craft shuttling out and back without too much damage. Meanwhile, off the starboard bow of Britannia, 10 small ships representing the hundreds of small craft of all shapes and sizes that crossed the channel on D-Day and the days that follow followed. Well, well, although not a D-Day veteran herself, Waverley does represent a type of vessel that played a, a significant, if, if rather surprising, role in the Normandy landings. Here they were, lined up in the Solent, six or so, of sh six or so ships of this type, some of them rather old, in fact. One of them dating back to the 19th century. She had to be actually towed into the Solent, but then I think she did make it across the Channel under, under her own power, and with her light anti-aircraft guns kept at bay those aircraft that showed up in daylight hours. Other small ships that we have here are, are, are um, the Tug Destiny, which actually did tow part of the Mulberry Harbour across the channel. Uh, there's the sailing training ship Royalist, and here, is a more, and here is a modern tug. Tugs played an absolutely key role in the landings. There were over 150 of them, and when you consider all the pontoons and other things that had to be towed across, you can see how even these apparently rather insignificant and mundane vessels were key assets in the landing. And here we have Destiny herself, a remarkable little ship built in the mid-1930s, the first diesel tug that the Royal Navy had. And it's very nice to see a veteran, a real veteran, of the landings here, something which you might have forgotten about. After all, who remembers tugs and who remembers pontoons? But without those pontoons, the Mulberry Harbours could not have been built. And without the Mulberry Harbours, the armies ashore would not have got sufficient supplies. Now passing the Silver Cloud. It's a brand new Italian cruise liner, but plenty of uh, veterans on board, mainly Americans and Canadians. And there are a few passenger cruise liners in the flotilla, mainly carrying veterans. And this is HMS Heckler. Third ship in the Royal Yacht Squadron, following Britannia and Patricia ahead of her. It's good there is a survey ship here because the Royal Navy's Hydrographic Service played an absolutely key role in the landings, like like. Uh, and many other forces, but the, without the hydrographers, the landing craft really wouldn't have known where to go ashore. Just before the landings, tiny landing craft, like the ones you've seen, were carrying surveyors around who tried to find out how the sand was, etc., so that the boats could come ashore. President Bill Clinton watching out, and I'm sure he'll be looking forward to the next bit. We look at some of the main ships of the US Navy. Patricia looks back at Britannia. Approaching another cruise liner owned by the Seabourn Cruise Line. Seaborne Pride, built in Bremerhaven in 1988, a Norwegian cruise ship of about 10,000 tons, 
150 passengers on board, mainly American. In fact, there were six American veterans on board who were invited to the garden party yesterday and the dinner in the guild hall in the evening. Unfortunately, the weather wasn't quite as nice as it is now. Absolutely foul evening. The view again from HMS Heckler. As they approach the USS Guam. seven Iwo Jima class amphibious assault ships of the US Navy. Another quite old ship, this one commissioned in January 1965, modified in 71. Has a capacity for 20 CH-46 Sea Knight or 11 CH-53 Sea Stallion helicopters. Can also carry carriers. Guam, named after a major American amphibious amphibious operation that took place on the other side of the world uh, in the Marianas in, uh, in June 1944 shows how the technology of amphibious landing has improved over the years. Although she can and does uh, lower landing craft over the side, her main role is landing troops by helicopter. She carries up to 20 helicopters of various shapes and sizes. She can operate seven of them at any one time. And this kind of, 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 uh, of landing technique, actually pioneered in part by the Royal Navy in the Suez operation in 19 in 1956 gives landing forces much greater range and striking power. Of course, being a flat top vessel, she is in effect a light aircraft carrier herself, she can be used for other roles too. Ships of this class have been used as the base for uh, mine sweeping helicopters, and also Guam has been used as a sea control ship. Really, it's something rather like a Royal Navy through deck cruiser, uh, carrying Harrier type aircraft and helicopters for the anti submarine role. A very flexible platform, although soon to be withdrawn from service and replaced by something even better. And the next ship in the line, a museum ship staffed by volunteers and run on voluntary donations. The Jeremiah O'Brien, a US Liberty ship, the last surviving working Liberty ship of 2,751 built. O'Brien isn't just a very historical ship herself, but she represents a truly amazing feat of shipbuilding. The Germans hoped that by sinking very, very large numbers of merchant ships by U-boats in the Atlantic and in the other oceans of the world, they could prevent America bringing supplies and troops across the Atlantic. In this, they failed because shipyards all up and down the east and west coast built ships such as the Liberty ships to standardize designs that could be churned out in huge numbers. Uh, on one particular day, 14 ships were launched and this meant that there were, there, there were sufficient merchant ships to bring the troops across the Atlantic and to make an enormous contribution, vital one, to Allied victory. She's actually sailed over from San Francisco, based originally on a British design, and captained by George Jahan, 78 years old, who did actually command a, a Liberty ship during the Normandy landings. Shortly after the landing, she loaded at, South, uh, at South, Southampton, sailed down the Solent, and arrived off Omaha Beach on the 10th. There were about 200 Liberty ships committed to the landings, and they were used largely as so-called MT ships, motor transport ships. Each carried about 120 army, army vehicles and 480 men, and they shuttled to and fro into the harbors off the beaches, unloading these troops and vehicles into landing craft, which then took them ashore, and thus keeping up the whole momentum and force of the landing and keeping the insatiable demands of a modern army for vehicles, men, and, and, and other supplies satisfied. Well, the next warship in the line is the world's largest, the aircraft carrier USS George Washington, the flagship of the visiting American task force. Although in 1944, America's carrier's striking fleet was otherwise engaged. 
Normandy landings took place on the other side of the world. The mightiest carrier fleet the world had ever seen with a thousand aircraft set sail from Majuro Atoll in the Pacific. This was the Americans' major theater of naval war and they were taking on the main force of Japanese carriers. Almost a thousand American aircraft faced about 450 Japanese. Losses were terrible on the Japanese side. The Americans called it the Marianas turkey shoot. Not many aircraft got through to attack the carriers. Most were shot down in the air. When the Americans counterattacked, their pilots were horrified to learn that the Japanese were much further away than originally estimated. This meant that when they came back, exhausted pilots often found themselves in carrier accidents. Yes, amazing having to land on one of those things bobbing around in a rough sea. This is the USS George Washington of the Nimitz class. There are actually 13 ships over from the US Navy, led by the George Washington. The total fleet involvement, in fact, is about 14,000 US sailors and Marines. Uh, the George Washington can take about 80 fixed-wing aircraft, including F-14 Tomcats and F-A-18 Hornets, and six Sikorsky-seeking helicopters. Also on board, the Atlantic Fleet Band, Other VIPs on board include the Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, the Secretary of Defense, Dr. William Perry, and Sacker, the senior Allied Commander Europe, General George Julwand, who really is the modern Eisenhower, who went on to be Sacker in the 50s. I think it's of great political significance that, uh, that this ship has come, and also that she has all these people on board. The aircraft carrier is now perhaps more important than it's ever been as the key power projection asset of the United States. What we're, what we're commemorating today is an exercise in power projection, one of the most important in the past, but still obviously the United States needs to project power ashore at various times, and it has chosen the carrier as its main instrument of doing this. President, uh, President, President Clinton's administration has uh, has decided to maintain a carrier fleet of quite considerable size, carrying aircraft such as the such as the uh, such as the A6, and that and uh, these these ships um, uh, provide basically a mobile air force, a mobile airfield, an airfield that can lose itself in the ocean, an airfield that is actually very hard for any hostile power to find, and even if it finds it, very hard to take out, destroy. These are still very heavily armoured ships. The Americans learned all the lessons of the Second World War that lightly protected carriers uh, are, are extremely vulnerable and now they give carriers powerful armored decks and, and armored hangars like we did to our carriers in the Second World War and these huge carriers are extremely are, are, are extremely powerful extremely invulnerable and key assets for the United States So, Britannia and the heads of state on board turn around at the end of the fleet as it's lined up. Approaching the QE2, we'll swing around to the left as we look from Heckler. The Cunard flagship. And the, the captain, master, Captain Robin Woodall, launched in September 1967 by John Brown and co. on Clydebank. Made her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York in 1969, registered in Southampton. She would normally have a crew of about 1,000 with about 1,791 passengers, so very nearly one uh, to every two, one crewman to every two passengers, which is certainly luxury cruising. But the QE2 has brought hundreds of American vets over for these three days of celebrations.
amongst the many on board, of course, Vera Lynn and Bob Hope, who will be providing entertainment, uh, I think certainly on Monday, over in France. And just like her predecessors, the great queens, the QE2, of course, has also experienced war at first hand, albeit on a rather smaller scale. In May of 1982, the flagship of the Cunard Line left Southampton Dock with 3,000 troops aboard. Relations watched as their loved ones began their journey on the requisitioned cruise ship to the South Atlantic. The QE2 followed another luxury cruiser, P&O's Canberra. Once in the Falklands, she was to play a key role in recapturing the islands. From her luxurious cabins, Royal Marines boarded the landing craft that led the first assault wave of the San Carlos landings. The British government had given an assurance that she'd never enter a war zone. But the great white whale, as she'd become known, found herself a prime target of the Argentinian Air Force. But she survived. Three months and 16,000 miles later, the Canberra returned to Southampton amid memorable scenes of jubilation. And restored now to a more luxurious state after <laughs> being hardened for battle. There is Canberra on the right of the picture with the yellow fun funnel. The QE2 on the left, the George Washington in the background. And the Royal Yacht sails round. Chartered by the Royal British Legion carrying British American and Canadian veterans, and she'll also be where the service of remembrance is held in the channel a little bit later on when Brian Hanrahan will be bringing us events. Return to home waters after the Falklands. From here, there is an entire fleet of little boats blocking the water between us and the Royal Yacht as it comes round. It's flags flying, the helicopters in the background and the other big ships lying at anchor everywhere. And the veterans are lining the rails. This is their big moment. This is the Queen coming to see them, not them coming to see the Queen. And it's the moment they've been waiting for all morning. And uh, I have with me two of them who have been here all morning watching the, the, uh, the events off the side, uh, Bert Holmes and Edmund Hurt. Bert, what, what are your feelings now when you're here? Absolutely over the wall. Yeah, it's really, you just can't believe it. You can't take it all in, not really. Um, just, I, I really must thank my son for book, booking us on here like this. Uh, so it was your son's idea to bring you here? Exactly, my birthday present, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really something else. It's, it's unbelievable. It, you just can't explain it, not really. Mr. Hurt, Edmund, tell us, tell us how you're feeling now. Oh, I'm feeling uh, over the moon. Like the last said, I'm gobsmacked, really. It's, <laughs> it's fantastic, this yeah. is. And, uh, you know, it's a fitting tribute to all them lads that uh, yeah. gave the lives for us. It, you, I mean, you couldn't get anything a bigger tribute than this. Yeah. And you've got the royal family here and uh, the QE2 and all the big ships. It's, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful sight, isn't it, with everybody fantastic. here? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. Well, we've just seen a little yacht going past our commentary box with a sign on it saying, Thanks for freedom, and it's really important, I think, to remember that, that that's what this is all about. And uh, it's an important message, not only for, of course, all the veterans who know what it was all about, but for the younger people watching.
camera under the command of Captain Ian Gibb. Displacing 44,807 tons. It's, it's actually, despite being a lovely sunny day, it's quite windy and it really has been quite cool and obviously everyone quite well wrapped up. I'm sure Admiral of the Fleet, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, thoroughly enjoying all this. You sometimes wonder for the safety of some of these little craft when they're all in like that, particularly the sailing ones, but uh, I'm sure they all know what they're doing. Rear Admiral Rob Woodard talking to Prince Philip. Of course, Her Majesty the Queen remembers well the dark days of the Second World War, and this must be a very meaningful day for her as well. And still, the swordfish overhead. Swordfish played a rather significant role in the Normandy landings. Uh, they laid smoke uh, on the flanks of the invasion armada, and they were also used as rocket-firing anti-e-boat aircraft, keeping the German small craft away from the landing forces. Among the many veterans on board the Canberra, the National President of the Royal British Legion, Vice Admiral Sir Geoffrey Dalton, KCB. Predominantly British veterans on board Canberra, but also 20 to 30 war widows, and also some American Canadians and others from South Africa New Zealand, Ireland, and the Netherlands. South Africa not really represented in these commemorations, although, of course, there were many South Africans who took part individually in the Second World War, flying in the Royal Air Force and fighting on the ground. And the next in the line from the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, the RFA Sir Percival, one of four LSLs, well, four of this class anyway, landing ships logistic. This one commissioned in March 1968. Went to the Falklands where her sister ship, Sir Tristram, was severely damaged. And another one, Sir Galahad, was actually sunk off Bluff Cove. These really are very suitable ships for a D-Day commemorative review. They are the successors of the old landing ship's tank. In fact, they're about the same size as the original British landing ship's tank that were converted from Maracaibo tankers, shallow draft tankers. Uh, later, uh, a whole mass of production LSTs, landing ship's tank, were produced in the United States. And they played a, a, a very important role in the landings, bringing, bringing, bringing supplies in. In a way, they pioneered roll-on, roll-off ferry services uh, to the, to the, to the harbours and the beaches. But she also reminds us of the mass of smaller landing craft from which the troops and vehicles actually stormed ashore over the beaches in the initial waves. Landing tanks had been a problem, and so a special a special craft had to be developed for it. This was the tank landing craft, or the landing craft tank, LCT, uh, seen here at Spithead, where the review is taking place. Other kinds of landing craft were landing craft infantry, and some of those were converted into landing craft headquarters, LCHs, to command squadrons of landing craft. 
Among those they commanded were small landing craft infantry, small LCIS, seen here crossing the channel for the invasion. They could carry about 98 troops each, quite a large number for such a, for such a small craft. Most of the army troops, however, went in larger infantry landing ships, and they had to, be, had to be hoisted over the side or climbed down over the side into LCA, assault landing craft. But tanks and vehicles tended to cross the channel in the small LCTs, and their tanks went ashore and carved out the beachheads. Just coming into view, the Christina Regina, one of the last steam vessels to be built in the world, actually, although she's now diesel-engined. 3,700 tonnes. She's exactly the same kind of vessel that was, that was converted into a landing ship infantry small. We, we, uh, we often forget, I think, that as well as specialist landing craft, the Normandy landings were, you might say, the cross-channel ferry's finest hour. Very large number of channel ferry type and size craft were, were fitted out with landing craft, and over the sides the troops went. The ship's company manning ship of HMS Urshida, a conventional sub of the Upholder class, commissioned in 1992, but about to be withdrawn uh, a little bit later this year because of the defence cuts. Now, on board uh, is a gentleman called Mr George Honour, who was commanding officer of X-23 on D-Day, which was a mini-sub, and his was an extraordinary story. Yes, he, he must have had w one of the hardest, hardest of D-Days. Two, two X-craft were sent, one to Sword Beach and one to Juno Beach to mark the landings. Their job was to submerge, and then as the landings came in to surface and show lights and, 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 and uh, radio and sonar boys so that the landing craft landed in the right place. Of course, they had to be sent out early. They went out late on the 2nd of June, and they learned that the landings had been delayed by, 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 by 24 hours. So they had to submerge, and they spent virtually all of the 5th of June submerged. Then they came back into position, submerged again, and then surfaced just before the landing took place for their guidance roll. Of course, in the rough, in the rough weather, uh, they, they shipped a lot of water, and it was an extremely uncomfortable time. A, a rubber dinghy had to be sent over the side, uh, and the submarines themselves had to fly a large flag so, so that they wouldn't get run down by all the landing craft. In all, a very harrowing operation. 64 hours dived out of 76 hours at sea, the rest of the time spent in rough weather off an enemy coast. They earned their submarine pay. Now coming up, three mine countermeasure vessels. The first of them, the French ship Loire, one of five Rin class depot and support ships, and she's the mothership for the Croix du Sud and the Clio. All of them come from Brest. The Loire actually has a hospital on board. These French ships demonstrate, first of all, the involvement of the French in the landings, uh, and there was, a, and perhaps of all the French services, the, the, the Free French Navy took a, a very prominent part in the landings. But also, of course, they lead us into the mine countermeasures part of the, of the review and the mine countermeasures part of D-Day. Admiral Kirk, the American commander of the Western Task Force, said that mine sweeping was the keystone of the arch in this operation. And if the ancestors of the mine countermeasures vessels that we're starting to see here had not been available in very large numbers, 255, the troops would just not have got across the channel. A number of channels, two for each beach, had to be, had to be, had to be swept, and it was a very, very difficult operation indeed. The tide changed in the middle of it, and this meant that the minesweepers had to go through a highly choreographed set of manoeuvres, reversing, forming into line, then forming into sweeping formation again. And this all being done at night, in the early hours of the morning, off a hostile coast. Happily for the mine countermeasures vessels, um, the Germans were not particularly awake, and they didn't bombard them. The second of the French ships is the Croix du Sud, which is one of ten Eridan class mine hunters. This is a tripartite effort actually with Belgium and Holland. Five hundred and ninety-five tons, 
capable of 15 knots and made of glass reinforced plastic hull as many modern mine countermeasure vehicles, uh, vessels are. Yes, the Normandy landing saw the first use of a modern kind of so-called influence mine. Most people think of mines as things with horns that you actually hit. But modern influence mines either, either detect the, the magnetic signature of the ship or the sound of the ship or the pressure wave of the ship or the reduction of pressure, to be accurate. Here we see HMS Herworth, which is a British mine hunter. And you notice I use the term mine hunter and not mine sweeper. These influence mines, many of them anyway, well, cannot be swept or can only be swept with considerable difficulty. Herworth is both a sweeper and a hunter. She's a very expensive ship because she has to be built with the lowest possible magnetic signature so that she won't set off mines if she's trying to, if she's trying to sweep them. But quite often she will hunt for them. She will use a high resolution sonar to try to find the mine on the bed of the sea. And then a diver is sent down or something called a poisson auto propulseur, a, a, a French built automatic fish which goes down with a television camera to, 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 to see what's down there and dispose of it. Glad you said that, Eric. The waters of the Solent frothing beneath the armada of little ships. In fact, talking of little ships, the Dunkirk Little Ships Association are also here. They've been watching from an anchorage. Dunkirk really, of course, significant in the eventual success of D-Day because the lessons that were learnt there and from various exercises and operations after that all contributed to the eventual success of D-Day. Notably, a rather unsuccessful operation at Dieppe in 1942. And as a result of that, it was many of the funnies that were built the uh, special vehicles that were needed to get the troops safely ashore. Many of which were landed from landing craft like the Ardennes. This is one of the few vessels left in the British services, and you notice I didn't say the Navy because she is in fact operated by the Army, uh, which is roughly the size of, of, a, of a, uh, a World War II landing, uh, landing craft rather than a larger landing ship. Now, many of the funnies that Julian mentioned, the specialist armoured ar arm armored vehicles, were landed in the initial waves of the landings in order to, to burst a way through the beach defences. Some other landing, some other, some other armoured vehicles fired actually from the landing craft themselves. There were a large number of support craft with armoured vehicles manned by the Royal Marines, uh, with guns fitted of a destroyer size, and these provided vital close support. So a number of ships that we've seen in that review, the Seabourn Pride, Canberra, the QE2 and the Vista Fjord, another Cunard passenger lineup, will be departing to join the uh, Ramsey flotilla in mid-channel. Patricia, with the review complete, the uh, Trinity House vessel Patricia should peel off and do another circumnavigation of the flotilla. President Clinton will make his way from Britannia back onto the USS George Washington, which is his home base for these celebrations. those of us that never experienced the horrors of war, we can only imagine what it must have been like to have been on board the ships 
pretty much at this time 50 years ago when they were starting to set sail on the greatest ever amphibious invasion. with Commander Tim Lawrence. An unknown poet of the day wrote, the barge-like boats packed panting tight eat up the narrow strip of water, and in the sky the grey wings wait, poised on the edge of a well-planned slaughter. Thankfully, it was well planned. It could so easily have been a massive slaughter of the Allied forces. The Trinity House vessel Patricia turns away to loop round the Royal Yacht. Somewhat prophetically, General Montgomery said at the time, in the better days that lie ahead, men will speak with pride of our doings. And surely there must be many men today speaking with great pride of their doings. A little earlier this year, in fact, the Prime Minister said, every one of us should remember that we're here today because of that endeavour, that sacrifice, remember and be thankful. President Clinton saying his farewells. I'm sure thanking and congratulating. Imagining back 50 years and the fleet was on its way, churning stomachs in a churning sea. The future of the free world depended on how well each man did his job. There were many unsung heroes, but the Royal Navy made sure the army got the best start it could. A long and proud tradition would allow nothing less. So, a fleet set sail with a great deal more colour and an altogether different purpose from the departure of 50 years ago. Then, of course, there were so many ships that this area of Portsmouth was called Piccadilly Circus. An RAF pilot who passed overhead at the time said it looked as if the fleet was towing the Isle of Wight out into the sea. The veterans here in Portsmouth should be, feel justly proud that their valiant efforts have been commemorated with such force and such dignity today. From South Sea, good afternoon. And uh, so they have Piccadilly Circus indeed, but of a very human, civilised kind. Fifty years ago then, the forces of the Allies were committed, the embarkation complete and the huge force ready for the assault. And that greatest airborne and amphibious force ever assembled 
It had a clear mission to enter the continent of Europe, to reach the heart of Nazi Germany and destroy its power. Join us again in an hour's time for events as they move here to Normandy and also for the mid-channel service of commemoration from Canberra, filled with those for whom the campaign wasn't just an event in history, but a moment when they looked death in the face and when many of their comrades met it. It's June the 5th, 1944. Tonight, Rome is celebrating its liberation. Princess Elizabeth has made her first public speech. We have film. And Gone with the Wind, it has, after four years at the same London cinema. Join us later for News 44. This evening, I'm the start of a story that shaped history. Your efforts will ensure the freedom of many, many People. I was very hesitant to get off that boat because it was, it, I mean, it was murder. The first man I seen dead, I looked at him and I thought, well, why is he sleeping? Because I was so naive about death. And at the end of it, we had 75 on our feet out of 150. Turning the tide, the D-Day landings on BBC One. Sunday Grandstand continues on BBC Two now with further coverage of the first test between England and New Zealand. Here on BBC One in just over five minutes, part one of this week's EastEnders Omnibus. And that follows the news now on BBC One with Moira Stewart. Good afternoon. In Normandy, the weather has improved for the main event of the day there, a parachute drop by 1,400 British, Canadian and French troops. They'll be landing near Ronville to commemorate the airborne assault behind German lines in the early hours of D-Day. The troops will then march to Pegasus Bridge, one of the main targets of the raid. Veterans have already begun to gather there. The Prince of Wales will take the salute at a march past this afternoon. Thousands of veterans have attended a special memorial service marking the 50th anniversary of D-Day. The service at South, South Sea Common near Portsmouth was attended by the Queen, President Clinton and the Prime Minister. The Archbishop of Canterbury paid tribute to those who gave everything for freedom 58 years ago. After yesterday's grey skies, this morning was one of brilliance for the veterans gathering on South Sea Common. Thousands were around the war memorial for the drumhead service. The traditions of an improvised battlefield service around the drums served both as a reminder of the need for peace in the present and an act of remembrance for those who set off for the beaches of Normandy. And the Archbishop of Canterbury recalled the details which lodge in personal memories. The ship which got separated from one convoy and latched onto another, not knowing where it was going. The pungent smell of the self-heating soup, doing nothing for seasickness. The separation from loved ones as England fell astern. And the fear in the pit of the stomach as the beaches loomed up ahead. Afterwards, the Queen met some of those who'd served and other members of the royal family were moving into the huge crowd, followed by President Clinton and over a dozen heads of state and of government. The whole event, a huge exercise in detail and security, 
but for the visitors and the veterans, a morning of memories and excitement as the fly past soared overhead. Fifty-six aircraft from eleven nations. Below, an enormous flotilla, every kind of vessel, as the royal yacht began the review. The sun shone on this tribute to those who went to France, as they all set off on the same journey across the channel in remembrance. Kate Adie, BBC News, Portsmouth.